So picking up right where we left off, this is the second chunk of the Lecture 10 series, Lecture Chunk 10B. Still working through Chapter 16, we've already talked a little bit about the structural and, char and chemical characteristics of different sugars, introduced you to all of the small sugar forms, monodi and the oligos, and we'll start talking here about the chemistry that involves sugars. First we'll start with the chemistry of monosaccharides, and then we'll go on to larger polysaccharides. We'll talk about glycogen, starches, uh, glucose storage mechanisms, cellulose as a complex carbohydrate for structural support, and uh, we'll actually skip bacterial cell walls because they're a little bit of a of a weird test case scenario, so we'll scrap those for the sake of, um, of shortening the material, focusing on what's far more important. And then in the last chunk we'll talk about glycoproteins and lectins to give some examples of the other functional things that sugars do that are energy independent. So let's jump right in and talk about some chemistry that involves sugars, and what better chemistry to talk about first than redox reactions, because we're so comfortable with them already. Redox reactions with sugars are probably one of the most important things that can happen in biochemistry. It's certainly what we're going to spend much of this semester on. As always, as we have already said, redox reactions are nothing more than the transfer of electrons, but since where electrons go, energy is being carried, we use redox reactions to transfer energy. These redox reactions will always be about the energy. Uh, the electrons are secondary. It's the energy we're trying to move. And so essentially what we will be doing in metabolism is oxidizing sugars. Remember that an oxidation reaction is the stealing of electrons. And so while we steal or oxidize uh, electrons from sugars, we are stealing the sugar's energy as well. So this oxidation of sugar is what's going to provide most of the energy we need for making ATP. By the end of the semester, we'll see how that's possible. And really, if you think about it, if you are taking a chain of carbons and oxidizing every single one of those carbons, essentially stealing its electrons and protons, if you fully oxidize carbon, you have carbon dioxide. Fully oxidized carbon, that is carbon that has had all its electrons stolen from it, is really nothing more than a carbon ready to make bonds with oxygen. And so the carbon dioxide we exhale are the remnant carbons of the sugars we've consumed that are fully oxidized with oxygen. The water we already talked about. The water comes from the oxygen we inhale uh, being loaded with those energy depleted electrons and the protons that follow them. If you think about it, and we discussed this a little bit uh, early on in the semester in class, the reverse of that reaction, starting with carbon dioxide and water, and adding external energy into that mix through sunlight is how photosynthesis makes sugars. So our metabolism is taking sugar and getting energy out of it and making carbon dioxide and water as byproducts, and photosynthesis is taking carbon dioxide and water, putting energy into it in order to make sugars. Pretty incredible. To be a little bit more specific, in sugars, if there is an aldehyde group, if it's an aldose we're talking about, it's that aldehyde group that is actually oxidized. It's oxidized to a carbonyl. So here's the aldehyde group that we're talking about. If we look at that carbon, it's got a proton sitting on it. That proton is also masking an electron that we're after. And so if we oxidize that carbon, we have added an oxygen in that hydrogen's place. And of course, that oxygen rapidly picks up a spare proton because of its unpaired electron. So we have oxidized this sugar. What that really means, and what we can really say, is that this sugar aided in something else being reduced. In other words, this sugar gave its electrons to something else. Any molecule that aids in the reduction of something else is a reducing agent. Therefore, this sugar was a reducing agent, and these sugars are specifically referred to as reducing sugars. They are able to give their electrons up to other things. They can cause other things to be reduced. Redox reactions are not the only things that can happen to sugars. We can also phosphorylate them. In fact, phosphorylating sugars is probably the most important and certainly the first critical step of metabolizing glucose. The very first step in glucose breakdown is its phosphorylation at its sixth carbon, creating glucose 6-phosphate, this molecule. This will be the first step of the process we talk about in the next lecture. The reason this is done is for two reasons. Obviously, when we phosphorylate a sugar, we've added a negatively charged group to it, so we've just charged this sugar and given it a negative charge. Once this sugar is bulky and charged, there is no way it will ever float through the cell membrane, because as we've already discussed as well in this class, 
bulky things have a hard time getting through the membrane. Charged things never get through the membrane. So if you're a bulky and charged sugar, you're essentially locked in that cell permanently. But also glucose tends to be fairly non-reactive on its own. But charged molecules are highly reactive. So this phosphorylation is also an activation step making glucose much more reactive and making glucose much more willing to engage in chemistry with other molecules. On more to glycosides, we've talked about glycosic, glycosidic linkages already in the previous chunk, but let's put some more meat on those bones. We can not only make glycosidic bonds with amines and alcohols, we can actually make glycosidic bonds with other sugars. Through the hydroxyl group of one sugar, we can make a bond with a carbon of a neighboring sugar, Again, that would be a glycosidic bond or a glycosidic linkage. And what we will have after that is a glycoside. If those two sugars are bridged to one another through an oxygen, we have an O glycoside, O for oxygen. So here's an example of two sugars that are linked together through an oxygen atom. That linkage is a glycosidic linkage, and this is now an O glycoside because that oxygen is bridging the interaction. We can also make N-glycosides, where it's a nitrogen that's serving as the bridge. Two sugars bound to one another through a nitrogen. Or, in fact, two sugars, uh, one sugar bound to anything through a nitrogen would give us an N-glycoside. And we've already discussed this example, but this is an N-glycoside. This, of course, is an example of a ribose sugar. This is a nucleotide now, where we have our three phosphates, we have our ribose sugar, and we have our nitrogenous base linked on there as well. Yes, this is a glycosidic bond, just as we've defined it in the previous chunk, but now we can be a little bit more specific and say that this is an N-glycoside because the glycosidic bond is occurring through a nitrogen. Glycosidic bonds between individual sugar monomers through monosaccharides is how we begin building these larger complex carbohydrates such as oli oligo and polysaccharides. We can have many different types of glycosidic bonds, obviously. We have O's and N's. Even their configuration can differ. There are many different sugars that we can link together as well, and so the diversity is huge. Also, the chemistry of these chains of sugars depends very largely not only on the types of sugars in the chain, but the types of bonds holding them together. So let's begin then talking about more complex carbohydrates. Here's a disaccharide, two sugars that are linked together. And this is a glycosidic bond. It's an O-glycosidic bond because the linkage is occurring through that oxygen. Anytime we link two sugars together, we have a disaccharide. And these are some of the most common sugars in our diet. Sucrose, table sugar, the sugar you bind from the store and bake with, the sugar you might add to your coffee, that is a disaccharide. It's a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. So this is table sugar. This is what sucrose looks like chemically. It's an O-glycosidic bond. In order to break sugar up into its individual monomers, you need an enzyme, an enzyme that can cleave that O-glycosidic bond, and the enzyme that destroys sucrose is called sucrase. Sucrase is able to cleave this glycosidic bond and release glucose and fructose as individual monosaccharides that are then metabolized through the processes we'll begin talking about in the next lecture. Of course, we've all heard of lactose. Lactose is also a disaccharide. Lactose is milk sugar. And it's a disaccharide of glucose and galactose. This is what lactose looks like. And you can see the bond is different. Whereas here, the glycosidic bond is in cis. Uh, both aspects of the bond are heading in the same direction. This is a glycosidic bond in trans. Still an O-glycosidic linkage, but it's a trans linkage. If you want to break these two monosaccharides up and metabolize them separately, you need an enzyme to cleave that glycosidic bond. And we all know, I'm sure, that that enzyme is lactase. Individuals who are lactose... Uh, intolerant, lactose-sensitive, simply don't make enough lactase naturally to break this glycosidic bond. And so lactose sugar becomes hard to digest and gives them uh, gastrointestinal discomfort. Those are disaccharides, but we can go even further. We can make polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are literally polymeric oligosaccharides. Lots and lots and lots of sugars linked together into very large structures. Individual glucose monomers can be stored in these large arrays of complex glucose polysaccharides. Glycosidic bonds are used to link each of them. Those glycosidic bonds can give rise to straight chains, or we can have a branched chain structure, which I'll show you in just a second. 
The name of the polysaccharide that we use as animals, as animals in the animal kingdom, the way that we store our glucose for short-term storage is in a molecule called glycogen. And glycogen is a branched structure made up of straight O-glycosidic bonds and branched O-glycosidic bonds. So if we zoom in, we see three monomers here of glucose. All of these are glucose monomers. And this is an example of a straight chain, and we can see we also can branch off the chain. If we kind of zoom out, and here is what we were just looking at, here is that first glucose, here's the next one it's linked to in a straight chain, and here's the branch. We can see that if we link enough of these together, we start to get a lot of glucoses in a fairly small space. If we zoom out even further, each one of these circles represents a single glucose monomer, and we can see lots of glucoses linked together in a straight chain configuration through standard O-glycosidic bonds. But occasionally, every once in a while, we can branch as well, we can branch as well, we can branch as well, Oops. and create this branched monomer. Putting uh, glycogen in this form, using this kind of form or conformation to store glycogen, allows us to hold more glycogen in a small space because this branched conformation takes up less room in the cell. There's another consideration as well for storing sugars this way. I won't get into that now, but uh, in many, many weeks we'll ret return to glycogen and we'll talk a little bit more about why glycogen makes sense as a storage mechanism then. Now, plants don't have glycogen. Instead, plants have starch. That's how plants store their own glucose for short-term storage, for energy storage later on. And plants diversify their storage into two forms, two forms of starch. One is called amylose, and that's an unbranched chain of glucose monomers. It is a, just a single linear chain of glucose, but that chain is coiled so that it takes up less room. You can get more amylose per unit space when you coil it in this way. The other starch form is called amylopectin, and amylopectin structurally looks a lot like glycogen. It is branched. So you have these very long, straight chains of glucose, but occasionally, every once in a while, you'll also have a branch point giving rise to kind of an, an arm or branch of that tree of amylopectin. About half of the total amount of carbohydrates that all human beings eat is in the form of starch. So very many of our sugars come from uh, what we don't think of as sweet foods, but starchy foods, uh, wheat products, uh, potato products, and, and things of that nature. Both forms of starch, amylose and amylopectin, can both be rapidly hydrolyzed to individual glucose monomers. In our saliva, the first stage of digestion occurs in our mouth, obviously by chewing our food, but also our saliva is teeming with an enzyme called alpha amylase, and not surprisingly, I'm sure, alpha amylase can cleave amylose and start removing individual glucose branches from the end of this, um, from the end of an amylose branch. Amylase isn't quite as efficient on amylopectin, but it can break amylopectin down, and so starch in general is digested initially in our saliva. You can do a little experiment if you'd like, actually, to see this happen in your own day-to-day -day life. The next time you're eating bread or pasta or potato, anything starchy, take a piece of that, put it on the tip of your tongue. On the tip of your tongue is where your sweet taste buds are. The taste buds that can detect sweet are on the tip of your tongue. Put that bread or pasta on the tip of your tongue and leave it there for a few minutes. And it will eventually begin to taste sweeter and sweeter. And the reason why that's happening is because as that bread sits on your tongue and the amylase in your saliva gets to work, individual glucose monomers are being released. And those glucose monomers are being detected by the sweet taste buds on the tip of your tongue. So it's a, a nice little experiment you can do just to kind of see what we're, happen what we're talking about here happening in the real world. So that leads us to cellulose, not a storage form for energy, but a structural molecule made of glucose. So cellulose is another polysaccharide of glucose that's found in plants. In fact, believe it or not, cellulose is one of the most abundant organic compounds on the earth. When it comes to things that living cells make, cellulose is one of the most abundant. It is an unbranched polymer but unlike amylose, it doesn't coil, it remains straight, so it's a straight chain of glucose. And in fact, these straight chains of glucose are so linear, so straight, that they are referred to as fibrils. They're almost like individual fibers. And those fibrils of glucose come together and create a twined 
rope of glucose, and that's essentially what cellulose is. So you can kind of track it here. You see in this image it shows you that indeed what you're looking at are individual links, individual chains of glucose. Each glucose is a link in that chain, and these chains of glucose are very, very fine. And many, many of these chains of glucose come together to form a microfibril. Many, many microfibrils come together to form a macrofibril. And many microfibrils come together to form a cellulose fiber. Those cellulose fibers then weave together like a wicker basket to create the cell wall of a plant. Pretty incredible, right? So there is tons and tons of glucose stored in these cellulose plant walls, all linked together and all interacting with one another. Now, unfortunately, animals, mammals, lack the enzyme cellulase that is able to cut these glucose monomers off. That's why we can't digest wood. As you probably can realize or think, there is one animal that we're well aware of can digest wood. It's the bane of many a homeowner's existence, and that's termites. Termites, in fact, in their gut, harbor and provide safe haven for bacteria, bacteria that make cellulase. So termites eat the wood, the wood goes to their gut, in their gut that wood is digested by bacteria, the excess glucose that the bacteria doesn't need is used by the termite in order to survive. So it's kind of frustrating because wood, all plant matter for that matter, is jam-packed with sugar. But not many things on this planet can eat that plant matter because most of us don't have cellulase. So since we can't liberate those glucose molecules, we can't metabolize them, and all of that cellulase pretty much goes to waste. Also driving home the importance of the diversity of these glucose uh, linkages in general, these glycosidic bonds, here is cellulose and here is starch and glycogen. Now starch and glycogen are held together by 1,4 glycosidic bonds, meaning that the carbon of one sugar is linked to the fourth carbon of the next sugar. Carbon 1 of one sugar is linked to carbon 4 of the other sugar. And if you look at cellulose, you see that it's the same exact thing. It's a 1,4 glycosidic bond. So we have glucose here, we have glucose here. We have carbon 1 linked to carbon 4 here, we have carbon 1 linked to carbon 4 here. But the conformation of this bond is an alpha conformation. The conformation of this bond is a beta conformation. And that one subtle difference, merely the shape of the glycosidic bond, is enough to make the enzyme that cleaves this for energy unable to recognize this. So frustrating. We're so close to being able to liberate glucose from cellulose, but we can't do it because the enzyme is too specific. So the only difference between cellulose and starch is the shape or type of glycosidic bond between the glucose subunits, but that's enough to make it undigestible. So how do we build one of these things? How do we build a large oligosaccharide? Well, we need a type of an enzyme called a glycosyl transferase. A glycosyl transferase does what its name suggests. It transfers gl sugars, glycos. So glycosyl transferases catalyze the formation of the glycosidic bonds of the type that we just saw linking monosaccharides together into a chain. However, because those bonds are so different and because the sugars that are being linked differ as well, each pair of sugars being linked needs its own specific glycosyl transferase. In other words, if you're going to make sucrose, you need a specific glycosyl transferase that can link a glucose to a fructose in just the right way through that O-glycosidic bond. That glycosyl transferase that links glucose to fructose to make sucrose, to make table sugar, cannot make lactose because that's a different linkage between two other sugars. So each specific glycosidic bond, each specific linkage, requires its own specific and unique glycosyl transferase. If you think about this in a larger perspective, it's fairly unique. DNA polymerase can link any nucleotide to any other nucleotide. When it comes to making the nucleic acid biopolymers, you need one enzyme. And that one enzyme can link any subunit to any other subunit, any monomer to any other monomer. Think of proteins. The ribosome can link any amino acid to any other amino acid. We have 20 different amino acids. 
and a single ribosome can link any of them together. What makes the sugars unique is that there isn't a single glycosyl transferase that can link any sugar to any sugar, like there's a single ribosome and a single DNA polymerase. Instead, you have unique glycosyl transferases that are specialized to only add one type of sugar to another in a very specific way. So this requires cells to have a huge number of genes for a huge number of different individual glycosyl transferases, and it actually also explains observations such as blood type. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the concept of A blood, B blood, AB blood, and O blood. You've probably learned about it in genetics as well from a genetic perspective. But those letters, A and B, refer to sugar groups that are added to the proteins of red blood cells. Sugar groups. So when you have A-type blood, you only have A-type sugars linked to your red blood cells. When you have B-type blood, you only have B-type sugars linked to the proteins of your red blood cells. People with AB blood have both types of proteins linked, and people like me with O blood can have neither type of protein linked. What allows a person to have AB blood is that they have genes in their genomes for the two different glycosyl transferases required to add A and B. Someone with A-type blood has one glycosyl transferase to add that A sugar onto their red blood cells, but their gene lacks, their genome lacks a functional gene for the B glycosyl transferase. And people like me are really mutant. You might have figured that out already. I don't have either working glycosyl transferase in my genome, and so my cells are unable to link an A sugar onto my red blood cells or a B sugar, and so my red blood cells are largely bare of those sugars. They are completely bare of those sugars because I don't make those specific glycosyl transferases. You want to link a sugar to some other compound, you need a specific glycosyl transferase to do that. So what we talked about in this lecture, we started off with the reactivity of some sugars. We talked about reducing sugars and redox reactions, and that led us to glycosidic bonds, O and N glycosidic bonds specifically. That showed us how we can begin linking sugars together to one another to build oligosaccharides, and we used sucrose and lactose as two examples of disaccharides in that context. Well, if we can link two sugars together, we can go a whole lot further, and indeed we can. We talked about much larger polysaccharides, such as glycogen, whoop, that's spelt wrong, I apologize, such as glycogen and starch, starch being amylose and amylopectin, and these are glucose storage mechanisms. We also talked about cellulose, pretty unique way of using sugar for structural reasons, and we talked a little bit about how cellulose comes together to form the fibers that it is. So some pretty interesting stuff, even though we're talking about boring old sugars. The last chunk will be relatively short. Let's finish up the story with some functional aspects of sugar, some amazing things that sugars can do that have nothing to do at all with energy or structure.